Hello everybody and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 209. This week the questions are taken from guide 253 on the Jesus of Lübeck and the Wednesday video countering plan Z, what the Royal Navy could have done. Starting off, Paolo Abib asks, how did the lease of Jesus of Lübeck work? What would happen if the English lost the ship? Would they need to pay a fine? And who manned the ship? So it pretty much worked similarly to most higher purchase or hire with an option to buy agreements through history. You paid a certain rate for the use of the ship, and obviously that could vary depending on if you just wanted the ship or if you wanted it crude or partially crude. And of course that number might not just vary linearly, because if you hired it with the services of, say, its master and the other experienced officers of the ship, then the people, while well, you had to pay their wages, the people who own the ship might be willing to hire it to you for a slightly lesser rate because they had a bit more trust you wouldn't just run it aground or something, because obviously an experienced sailor who knows his ship is worth an awful lot, especially when it comes to the age of sail. So when it comes to manning a ship, you've got to also remember the Hanseatic League had quite a presence in London at the time. So manning the ship would have been a bit of a mixed bag. You would have had some of the original crew who, you know, just like, well, we can make a bunch of money here as well as we can on the other side of the North Sea, as well as English crew, obviously, because you had to ensure the loyalty of the ship to Henry VIII. Then exactly what ratio that was at would depend quite significantly uh, you know early on when the ship shows up to the UK it's going to have an entirely Hanseatic crew but as it goes through its first missions there's going to be and obviously until it's purchased through there's going to be more and more English people aboard and then once it is purchased as I said some of the Hanseatic crew might have remained on board afterwards anyway but if the ship had been lost during its hiring period it would depend on how it would have been lost because if the ship had been caught by a massive storm and sunk along with a bunch of other ships then it's fairly likely that it's the value of its loss would have been claimed under whatever insurances the Hanseatic League still or Lübeck in particular still had it under whereas if Henry took it to war with the French and got it sunk then that it would be basically you break it you bought it so he'd still have to pay out as if he would buy the ship um, so that Lubeck wasn't out both money and ship. Herner Weisenberg asks, Any thoughts on the 1566 Adler von Lubeck? Looking at pictures and models of her, I always thought she looked very modern for her day, almost like a ship of the line from 200 years later. Well, in some ways she is, and in some ways she isn't. The Adler von Lubeck, as seen here, is very much a product of the mid to late 16th century. So she still has fairly large stern castles and forward four castles. On the other hand, she does have a double gun deck and she is fairly large. In fact, she's approximately the same size as a decent to large size third rate would be a couple of hundred years later. And of course, with that double gun deck, you can very much think she might fulfill that role. However, as I said, she does have the uh, rather large four and a half fighting tops that ships of her actual period have. Part of the reason that she has, um, she still looks fairly modern though, comparatively to others, is one, her great size means that even though the four and a half castles can be two or three decks high, proportionally they appear considerably smaller. And secondly, you also have the fact that the Hanseatic League's ships didn't go in for the more absurd levels of high fighting tops that some of the other nations and political entities did at the time. Indeed, the Jesus of Lübeck, when it was brought into service by the Tudor Navy, actually had its four and a half castles increased. Uh, the Hanseatic League having not apparently put them in high enough for Henry VIII's liking. And the extra weight and the in penalties on stability that were imposed by these castles still affects even a ship the size of the Adler von Lübeck, which was one of the biggest ships on the planet at the time, because when you look at her armament, although she does carry some heavy guns, most of her guns, numerous though they are, are quite lightweight. So even though she predates Vasa by a little bit, Vasa's broadside is actually considerably heavier because Vasa has 
full 24 pounder gun decks as would a number of her successors whereas much in again in a similar way to other 16th century warships the Adler von Lübeck carries a few large guns and then many 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 smaller guns so while she definitely does have features that make her look modern she isn't as modern as she might appear on first inspection but given that wooden warships of this period did have a penchant for lasting half a century or more if they were kept in good condition and valuable enough and Adler von Lübeck is big enough and mean enough to consider keeping around if she'd survived as a warship into the 17th century she could have been rebuilt into a competitor for sovereign of the seas I mean, you'd have to cut down the forecastle completely, cut down the stern castle quite significantly, obviously any general reconditioning and refits. But at that point, okay, she doesn't have three full gun decks, but with that stability and weight improvement from cutting down the upper part of the ship, you could then re-gun her kind of Vasa style with an all-heavy gun broadside, and then you'd have a very, very powerful and very competitive warship for the 17th century, or at least the first half of it. Steve C asks, why is the British Navy called the Royal Navy, but the army is just the British Army and not the Royal British Army or some such derivative like Royal Army? It comes down basically from two strands of things. The first of which is that the Royal Navy was at one point quite literally the Royal Navy or the Navy Royal the personal property of the king or queen at the time as in you know nothing to do with crown although they got them through you know the privilege of being the monarch but they were bought and paid for out of the monarch's personal finances not general taxation levied via parliament or anything like that that's why you could have things uh, again the referencing this week's five minute guide video uh, as far as the dry docks concerned with the jesus von lubeck it was the personal property of elizabeth the first having previously been personal property of her father and the intervening monarchs between him and her which meant she was perfectly at liberty to license it out to hawkins and drake for their for their voyages because well she could do what she liked with it she owned it it, she had no obligation to the government or the nation to use it in any way other than that which she saw fit. Whereas the army at the time didn't really exist on a permanent basis. There were soldiers, bodyguards and so forth, um, garrisons, etc. But they weren't part of a formal, large, organised army. Um, if the country needed large amounts of troops then it was very much as if it was not not quite but almost as if it was the battle of agincourt or a similar campaign back in the medieval period troops would be summoned um and either have their own equipment or be equipped and the command would be based partly or almost entirely on nobility and so on and so forth so there wasn't a single coherent royal army uh, as such as an ongoing budget item where the uk got its first permanent standing army was basically from the time of the english civil war although there had been a few moves in beforehand to try and establish it one that it hadn't really lasted that long but then the the army that became the basis of the british standing armed forces on land was the new model army which was of course the roundhead army um, i.e the rather not monarchist army the non-royalist army and uh, well you can understand why perhaps in the immediate aftermath of all that the king wasn't exactly um, going to be very happy about calling a bunch of people who defeated his father and caused him to be executed royal um, yeah that wasn't going <laughs> to happen um the flip side to that is that you do have a bunch of royal units within the army because again reflecting back on the uh, more medieval nature of the land-based forces in in britain you had various units that either had been semi-permanently raised in small numbers by the king or queen or later on that had were raised by the monarch um, or had some kind of a special affiliation to the monarch which is why you'll have various royal units 
within the army, but the army as a whole is still just the British army. The other thing is that because of this, when the standing army arose, it's never been the personal property of the monarch. Uh, part of the whole you know, restore, restoration of the monarchy held that the monarch could not categorize categorically could not have a standing army at their beck and call uh, it had to be paid for entirely via parliament and so parliament had to vote the money for it and therefore it was the british army lewis morris asks was the tudor navy any good well to answer that you kind of have to caveat it with two rather big qualifiers first of all in times of a full-on national emergency, like, you know, a gigantic enemy invasion fleet is coming up the channel, which is something that happened more than once during the Tudor period, the Tudor navy would not just be made up of the royal navy, as in the king or queen ships. It would be supplemented by ships that either just showed up to answer royal summons, basically like a floating seaborne feudal arrangement, which it pretty much was, um, as well as ships hired by the monarch for the duration of the emergency, plus various ships that showed up, you know, because it was in their best interest to do so. Usually these were organised by cities and so forth. So the quality, size and capability of the Tudor Navy varied massively. During peacetime it would be a relatively small thing. During wartime, as the Spanish found out at the time of the Spanish Armada, it could actually balloon to quite significant sizes and then very rapidly shrink again. And then coupled with that, of course, came the command and control elements, because you have a bunch of ships that have no prior experience working together, desperately trying to work out how to work together. So that's one of the two big caveats. And the second caveat is that the quality of the Tudor Navy is all over the shop. So in Henry VII's time, if we just focus on the royal ships they the royal navy was fairly small but you know didn't do a tremendous amount but for all that it was relatively well maintained under henry the 8th it grew significantly in size both in terms of the size of individual ships and the number of overall ships and it was generally kept in fairly good order and represented a relatively powerful fighting force albeit one that was still somewhat outnumbered by and potential enemy forces, such as at the Battle of the Solent, where the Mary Rose sank, you know, the Tudor Navy, Henry VIII's Navy, was a fairly powerful fighting force that the French had to reckon with, but on paper the French had a considerably larger fleet. It then decayed quite significantly towards the end of Henry VIII's life, and then you had uh, his son, um, Edward the whatever he was, 6th, 7th, I can lose track of how many Edwards we've got in this, in this country, um, then you had the very, very brief reign of Mary, uh, Lady Jane Grey and Mary I. And under all of those, the Navy basically stagnated. They, they built virtually nothing new. Some ships went out of service. Others quietly rotted away. And it was still pretty much that case during the first part of Elizabeth I's reign. And then, of course, tensions with the Spanish and the profits made from exploiting those tensions with the Spanish started to rack up the available budget and also rack up the uh, outside threat. And thus the Royal Navy began to grow in size and capability. And it started to introduce new technological innovations like the race-built galleon and so forth, even though that initially started off as a privately built venture. And so the Royal Navy of the latter Elizabethan period was a very different creature to that of the early Elizabethan period, um, again, in both terms of size and capability. So was the Tudor Navy any good? It could be, but it depends very much on which decade of the Tudor period you're looking at. Alex asks, how often did navies train on the guns and fighting tactics? Did it change and become more or less from the golden age of sailing through to World War II? Those are two very different things to be training on. So in terms of training on the guns, that varied hugely up until pretty much the 20th century. Whether or not a ship trained on its guns regularly or extremely regularly or not all that regularly 
depended almost entirely on the captain. Now, of course, there could be various social pressures, whether the Navy was going through a wartime period where performance was prized above all else, whether the Navy was going through an extended peacetime period where keeping everything spick and span was was um, required over all else, and also the personal wealth and interest of the captain, because certainly in the Age of Sail, the Admiralty would issue a ship with X amount of powder, which it could be used for training purposes, and once you'd use that up, well that's it. You can't use any further powder on the ship until you get a new allocation because that powder is there for wartime. But various captains who tended, especially if they capture prizes, to have a little bit of pocket change could and did in certain areas buy additional powder for their men to train with. And this could lead to huge, huge differences in the capabilities of various ships. So although you could have an average performance for a navy, you might find some ships that were 40-50% faster in terms of their gunnery than everything everyone else, and other ships whose gunnery was described as poor, i.e. they'd be 40-50 or maybe even 100% slower than everybody else. And so depending on a given ship, you might have gunnery training once a week, once a month, once a year, um, or anything in between, plus or minus a bit. Fighting tactics are completely separate, because no matter how fixated your captain is on having the most valuable ship for combat in the Royal Navy, if he is in command of a frigate that's been sent on a distant mission across the other side of the planet, you don't have an opportunity to practice fighting tactics alongside other vessels. Whereas if you are part of a blockade squadron of a dozen ships of the line, you probably have nothing else but that to alleviate the boredom. Um, so again, it, up until kind of the middle to late part of the 19th century, it could vary hugely depending on individual vessels. But as things become a little bit more regimented and consistent, as the Age of Iron and Steam takes over and then turns into the Age of Steam and Steel then gun practice and fighting tactics practice becomes more and more regular. Admittedly, it probably, compared to the ships that were more fanatical about it, becomes slightly less frequent, apart from anything the sheer amount of expense involved in those exercises has gone up quite considerably. But there will now be mandated routines of practice and standards to meet that are a lot higher than they had been in the past. And of course, with mechanical aids and so forth coming in, you could also get a couple of different types of practice coming in. So obviously fighting tactics would still require squadrons or fleets to go out on exercise, um, but you could now theoretically model those because the tools were there and the performances were a bit more known and less reliant on the wind. And when it came to the guns, you could train loading pretty much any time. That's why there's a bunch of dummy inert rounds carried on various warships so you could get your men skilled at loading and aiming the guns but you were still limited in terms of when you could practice firing the guns by the number of practice shells you had aboard and how many more the admiralty was willing to give you but it was a bit more persistent so you know if you as a captain went off and said right i my crew are brand new i'm going to spend the next month or so toodling around the north sea and uh, blowing up random bits of the ocean in an effort to get my crew up to spec with their gunnery, then when you came back into port, you could just put a request in and say, well, I've used up all my training shells, please send more, and the Admiralty would send more. And it would really only be if you did that every couple of weeks that someone would start raising an eyebrow and going, where exactly are you sending all these training shells? But it was quite vital to do because, of course, teaching men how to just load the guns didn't fulfil everything, whereas teaching men how to aim and fire the guns and then make adjustments for the corrections on range, that did make a lot of difference. Josh Thomas Moore asks, Modern ships use helicopters, and in the Sir Kouf video you mentioned the submarine had an autogyro. Did any other ships use or have plans to use early helicopters or autogyros instead of planes, and how many navies were looking into them? 
almost everybody was using auto gyros or helicopters at some point during World War II, uh, with the possible exception of the Italians, and I think that's largely because of their early exit from the war. Obviously, Sir Kouf had an auto gyro board. Uh, a number of submarines, including, of course, uh, the Germans, uh, quite famously later in the war, had auto gyros carried where possible. I think maybe the Japanese may have played around with it a bit as well, because that was a way of getting aerial observation without having to carry a full-sized aircraft, which was, of course, incredibly difficult for a submarine. Um, the use of auto gyros on smaller escort ships up to the size of destroyers, also something that occurred in various navies. Um, the widest range of aircraft of this type tested were on American, British and German ships, with the Germans getting most of the use out of them because of course they partly because necessity is the mother of invention um, but you know the kind of small helicopter or large auto gyro or auto gyro kite or whatever um, being used on smaller craft was definitely a thing that was coming in towards the latter part of the war um, some royal navy and u.s navy ships were being adapted for the use of full-on helicopters um, at least experimentally the Germans, as you can see here, were, were also doing this for anti-submarine warfare and scouting. Um, but you wouldn't see the kind of modern destroyer layout with the big helipad on the back. Uh, partly because these things were very, very small. And partly because, well, a, a modern destroyer is much, much bigger than an old school destroyer. And B, if they were going to have any aircraft on board, they wouldn't be sacrificing large amounts of space aft for the sake of a small aircraft although they some of them would later do that but in a war where guns were still very much the frontline weapon that wasn't going to happen so for the most part although naval forces did operate with and operate helicopters and auto gyros to a reasonably large extent apart from a few niche uses on small escorts and sub and submarines it was mostly operating alongside as in operating from uh shore stations and so forth rather than operating from ships in the way that we think of them today. Miles Johnston asks, I've been reading about the use of ranging guns on tanks and rocket launchers. The idea is you use a small caliber weapon with the same ballistics as a larger one and use it to gauge the range. Did anyone ever experiment with ranging guns for warships or do the ballistics of such large weapons make the idea impractical? Not that I'm aware of but there's a couple of reasons why it would generally be a non-starter. So in the early days when you're talking about, you know, Age of Sail and then Age of Iron, probably, you know, through most of the 19th century, the gun's accuracy is low enough that if you had some kind of very accurate ballistically matched spotting rifle or maybe a three or three pounder or 12 pounder the fact that that may or may not have hit your target is probably not going to have too many implications as to whether or not the gun it's spotting for is also going to hit the target regardless of anything else um between the role of the ship which they don't have too much in terms of compensation for um, and the other movements of the ship and the varying uh, qualities and really with relation to temperature and manufacture of shells and so forth, um, you would get probably just as good a result at 500 to 1,000 yards just by aiming the gun in the first place, and that's a, the big gun, and that saves you a bunch of weight and unnecessary complexity. And then by the time you get up to the 20th century and the rangefinders have come in, well, for one thing, optical rangefinders will give you just as, if not... A, better result at long distance than any kind of small spotting gun and secondly the, that's the other problem is range uh, any kind of small spotting gun that you can ballistically match to the larger one is either going to be hopelessly impossible to see uh, to spot the fall of shot at any kind of significant range or if you make it large enough to give it a long enough range and somehow also match the ballistics of the heavy gun it's spotting for you've basically added a heavy secondary battery anyway um and the sheer flight time of the shells as well you know if you fire even if i don't know on an armored cruiser if they decided to to try and ballistically match the 7.5 inch guns to the 9.2s on some of the later british armored cruisers 
you'd fire your 7.5 salvo and then you'd be sitting there waiting and in the time that you were waiting you could have fired a 9.2 inch salvo watched its fall of shot and then corrected anyway which is what you would do with a 7.5 inch fall of shot so you'd go through the same process except you'd be throwing fewer shells at the enemy because that first shot might have been on target <laughs> and the same thing with battleships you know any any gun that's large enough to actually reach out and spot and be visibly recognizable is also going to be very heavy take up a lot of space might as well be part of the secondary battery in and of itself isn't going to do too much damage and is going to cause a huge amount of delay while you're waiting for that spot of fall of shot when you might as well similar to the armor cruiser argument you might as well just have fired your main gun battery and watched for that and changed and observed your fall of shot James Reinlieb asks, You've talked several times about the impeccably named Captain Dalrymple Hamilton using the follow the steering for the fall of shot strategy in the battle with Bismarck, and I recall in the film version of the Battle of River Plate that Commodore Harwood employed a similar strategy against the Graf Spee. I was curious, when, if ever, did this become a recognised strategy, and if so, who first came up with it? Also, if it was a recognised strategy, would the solution be for the gunners not to make any corrections for each salvo? So steering after the fall of shot basically came in as a tactic. I'm not entirely sure who invented it or if it was simultaneously invented across multiple navies, but it, it came in as an idea. It began to percolate in the latter part of the 1900s. It certainly started to become uh, relatively well known in World War I, and then it was actually written into a number of different tactical manuals in World War II. But... The unusual thing about Rodney is that it was encouraged, it was kind of one one step off of almost mandated for destroyer captains, who obviously had fast, agile ships who would be under a lot of fire. It was mentioned as a useful tactic for cruisers, but no one really officially thought it would be a particularly brilliant idea for capital ships. Um until various officers, including Dalrymple Hamilton, who was a former destroyer commander, demonstrated that actually it worked perfectly well for capital ships as well. The entire idea, of course, being that, you know, if the enemy fires his guns at a certain spot, then because everyone knows that you will then correct for that gun's full of shot, the one place that the next set of shells are going to land is going to be not where that last salvo landed. So you steer for that last salvo. And then hopefully the enemy shells, which have now been corrected to a different uh, range and bearing, will land somewhere else, which will be also not where you are. Um, but yeah, Dalrymple, Hamilton and a few others are kind of really the ones who are credited with spreading the idea to full-on battleships. And to be fair, you can see why it, early on it wasn't thought of as a battleship tactic, because of course battleships were supposed to be sailing in a line, so the amount at which steering for the fall of shot was encouraged was you know inversely proportional to how much a ship was supposed to be expected to stay in a battle line thus the more freewheeling vessels like destroyers um, had a huge amount of freedom to do so and it that became less and less as you went up the line then of course in world war ii it turned out that there weren't that many battle line engagements with you know three or four battleships per side anyway as for, for whether or not it was a recognised strategy, part of the problem is that you are shooting against the future um, when you're when it comes to World War II style gunnery engagements. So even if your opponent holds course right up until the last moment that you fire your guns, at longer ranges it's entirely possible they may then change their course. But more to the point is that unless you're talking about fully integrated late war fire control systems especially those featured in some of the uh, u.s ships if you maneuver your vessel whilst under fire you are actually potentially compromising your own fire control solution to a certain degree depends exactly on what kind of fire control system you have um, to what degree you'd actually make that compromise but essentially if you maintain a steady course and your opponent is the one doing all the course shifting, that makes your calculations a lot easier because then your fire control system can use a steady calculated input on your own ship 
and only has to make corrections for the movements of the enemy. Whereas if you start manoeuvring as well, then not only have you got two entirely different sets of manoeuvring data for the calculations to spit numbers out for, but the range is changing a lot more dynamically because if you are sailing, let's say, in a straight line at constant speed, then if we take absolute range, for example, it can only be either decreasing, staying the same, or increasing, depending on whether your opponent is sailing towards you, parallel to you, or away from you. Whereas if you are manoeuvring quite violently yourself, and your opponent theoretically may may be manoeuvring as, as well, then the range could be decreasing really fast one moment, and then you both turn away from each other. Now it's increasing really fast. Then maybe you turn in pursuit, and now the range isn't actually increasing or decreasing, but both ships are moving in a given direction, so that's still going to affect where you're aiming your guns. You've got to lead the ship considerably more than if the range wasn't de increasing or decreasing because if you were in parallel with it, um, and so on and so forth. And so given all of that, you couldn't guarantee what your opponent was doing, so it, you wouldn't want to fire at the last recorded bearing if you'd missed because there's a reasonably good chance that your opponent might have changed course. Um, but they could have changed course away towards or something else. Um, if they stay the course and you were off, then obviously you are going to miss again. And there's also the fact that your ship may very well be manoeuvring, so you're going to have to recalculate the solution again anyway. If the gods wanted us to be happy, they would have given us a honey-based alcoholic beverage. Oh look, mead asks, how did the Royal Navy visits to Copenhagen in 1801 and 1807 shape naval thinking until minefields and motor torpedo boats made such endeavours a thing of the past. Well, it rather focused the minds of everybody. You see new build ports constructed thereafter in almost all cases are built with fantastic levels of fortification and existing ports that didn't have fortification get their fortifications upgraded quite significantly about the only people who break this trend are the royal navy because they're the ones who are threatening to copenhagen and everybody else um even though in some of the invasion scares they also um will add random martello towers and things to various ports um but this is how you end up with things like in the Crimean War when the Royal and French Navy show up at Kronstadt and the Russians have fortified the heck out of it, or to be fair, they're in the process of doing so, they've mostly completed that job. And that's almost entirely based on reflections of, you know, well, if somebody with a lot of ships shows up outside our port, um, then having the traditional level of shore fortifications and a fleet isn't going to be enough. So... See if, since we can't build more and more ships, then we have to really go for broke with the fortification side of things. And as I said, this pretty much holds true. Then you see a lot of the early advances in technology in the nineteen early very very early nineteen hundreds and the eighteen eighties eighteen nineties. They're all almost entirely based around harbour defence. I mean, obviously you have minefields coming in in the 18, late 1850s, early 1860s, but even towards the end of the century, wire-guided torpedoes for harbour defence. Submarines, initially, when they're actually serviceable units, harbour defence. Torpedo boats, harbour defence. Basically, Copenhagen, as much as, um, you know, people say, oh, Trafalgar and the War Napoleonic Wars and uh, allowed for a 100-year Pax Britannica, uh, Copenhagen part one and part two kind of also unleashed a hundred year fortify the heck out of every major fleet base you have on everyone gregory albert asks who would win it between a swarm of angry destroyer escorts i.e all of them versus a swarm of angry fletchers or clemsons either or both realistically the ball is going to lie in the court of the destroyers in any of these cases because although you're talking about just under 400 destroyer escorts which is considerably more than either the Fletcher Swarm or the Clemson Swarm. The Fletcher Swarm's outnumbered a reasonable bit over two to one. The Fletcher, uh, the Wicks Clemson Swarm is outnumbered about by about 40 percent but the destroyer escorts top speed varies between you know, 21 to 24 knots and the destroyers, whether they're Wicks, Clemsons or Fletchers, 
are all making well north of 30. In fact, they're probably going to be averaging you know, 35 uh, when they're pushing it. So the destroyer swarm can completely dictate when and where this fight takes place versus the destroyer escort swarm. Unless, of course, it's in some kind of confined bay area, but even then the destroyers still have a maneuverability advantage by considerable margin. The other thing is that in terms of one-shot kill weapons, i.e. torpedoes, only some, admittedly it's the majority, but still only some of the destroyer escorts even have torpedoes, and those that do have a single triple launcher, assuming we're using baseline configuration, if we're using end-of-the-war configuration, then even fewer of them have those because they began to be removed in favour of more AA and anti-submarine stuff. Whereas, you know, the Fletchers have th over three times as many torpedoes, the Wicks and Clemsons have four times as many. So despite the numbers disparity, even if you take into account the worst possible outbalance in numbers which would be destroyer escorts versus fletchers then the fletchers can actually still put more torpedoes into the water than the destroyer escorts can and when it comes down to guns it's pretty much the same thing some of the later destroyer escorts can kind of match the destroyers for range because they both have five inch 38s but a lot of the early ones have three inch guns and they're all universally outgunned. The destroyer escorts are either three three inch or two five inch, versus the Fletchers generally five five inch guns, and more advanced surface fire control systems, etc. 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 And laying smoke isn't going to help either side very much, uh, but of course the Fletchers will generally be carrying some more advanced radar systems as a whole, because they can. They're bigger. They can take more of those systems. So although if the battle closes to a very, very close range melee, there's going to be huge numbers of casualties on all sides. If this is a sort of open ocean battle, the destroyers should be able to carry it under pretty much all reasonable circumstances. Basically, apart from anything else, they can just, you know, roll up a line or for whatever formation the destroyer escorts take. Ferrata Victrix asks, you've mentioned that invasion scares were common in Britain across the 19th century. Which of those do you think were the most and least justified based on the state of the Royal Navy at that time? And were there times where there was a plausible threat of invasion and there wasn't an invasion scare to match? Essentially, at least in my opinion, I think you can boil down the plausibility of the 19th century invasion scares when you're not talking about some of the like either H.G. Wells or um this thing which yeah that that is i mean it's very cool and very steampunk it's also entirely implausible but nevertheless um see the picture above um basically i think look and see how the book deals with the royal navy and that kind of almost gives you a sliding scale of most to least justified because some of the invasion scares in the early part of the 19th century were basically we aren't spending enough on the Navy, um, France, dash, insert enemy of choice, but usually France, is building this brand new class of ship, therefore we're all going to die, oh woe is us. And towards the latter part of the 19th century, a lot of the invasion scares were very similar, you know, we're not spending enough on the Navy, dash, army, dash, both, and France, and increasingly Germany, has this powerful Navy, dash, army, and if they get over into England, then again, we're all going to die, and woe is us. However, in those invasion scares, they mostly concentrated on basically hand-waving away the Royal Navy, when you're looking at the common literature that was distributed about it. Uh, they either hypothesized that whatever new incremental technology that was being developed would allow a French, German, um, Spanish, whatever fleet to completely destroy and bypass the royal uh, destroy the royal navy and then obviously bypass its ability to defend the country um none of which ever really panned out whereas in the middle of the 19th century kind of the eight probably the 1850s say late 1840s early 1850s i uh, just before the ironclad era that's probably when it was the most plausible because yeah, you know, as as we can probably even imagine from from these days, 
the media had a habit of overhyping the latest and greatest technology, which also may or may not actually even have existed, and saying it could destroy everything. We know, obviously, in a more sane world, that outside of something like nuclear weapons, it's just not going to happen. You know, even a ship that's really, really good compared to its predecessors isn't going to last against ten times that its number of enemy vessels. Unless you're talking about like an ironclad versus wooden ship divide, in which case it's possible. Now, this is where that kind of middle period of the 19th century comes in. The ironclad period itself, um, not so plausible as an invasion scale, although somewhat more plausible than the front and back ends of the 19th century, mainly because, yes, whilst ironclads did offer a significant advantage to anyone who could use them over the old ships, the Royal Navy was, of course, building its own in considerable numbers. So, you know, you know meet fire with fire kind of thing. But in the immediate run-up to that period... Um, this is where I peg, as I say, peg the most plausible ones, because uh, apart, they these invasion scares didn't tend to either hand wave away the Royal Navy or claim that the Royal Navy would be utterly destroyed. They point out something that was actually far more realistic, which was the de widespread deployment of steam engines would allow an enemy to bypass the Royal Navy if the Royal Navy didn't have its own steam battle fleet, which, of course, they it did end up building a large force of. But, um, in theory at least, if the old ways of defeating invasion were followed, then, you know, the enemy would set sail, and then the Royal Navy would set sail, and they could meet somewhere in the Channel, and they could have a big fight, and it would all be done and dusted and over with. And if the enemy did... You know, somehow get massive advantage like they sailed with a really, really, really powerful southerly wind that was pinning the Royal Navy into its harbours, um, then they would equally be driven by the wind and where they could go would be limited and it would be quite dangerous for them to try. Steam engines removed all of that. Steam engines meant that a fleet could just set sail when it wanted to, including overnight, and it could arrive where it wanted to, even in the face of contrary winds. So if the British fleet was majority sail-powered they would have significant issues to versus a steam-powered fleet that could sail while the British were pinned in port and proceed at speed to wherever it was they cho had chosen as a favourable landing area. Um, also, because of the logistics of how long it took to prepare and sail um, wind-powered vessels, a lot of the Royal Navy's ports were further away from, let's be fair, mostly the French coast at that point, than would be plausible with uh, to, to to repel a steam powered invasion because under sail power you would have time to intercept an incoming enemy fleet under steam power you very well, well might not now of course all of this does to a certain extent ignore the logistics of the situation i.e if france is planning on invading england in the 1850s they've got to marshal all their troops move all their troops to northern france make all the preparations uh, for them, get all the supplies ready, etc., 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 all of which is going to take time, all of which is probably going to be quite easily noticed, and for which then the Royal Navy can make the necessary preparations. But if somehow they missed all that, or if those preparations, say, included a sail powered blockade of Cherbourg or wherever that was then scattered by a storm, and while the sa mostly sail-powered Royal Navy was trying to get itself back together, the steam-powered French Navy just went toodles and disappeared across over to the English side of the Channel. There is a realm in which those those are potentially plausible scenarios. Um, and so, yeah, that that's where I would put the plausible element. It's not massively likely, but it is plausible. Roadrunner Meatneep asks... In a few videos, you've mentioned that the French quad turret is basically just two twins stuck together, whereas the British quad was not. Mechanically, how do they differ? I would have thought that going from twin to triple to quad was just a matter of bigger turret plus another gun plus another ammunition elevator. Yeah, going up in terms of numbers of guns in a turret is considerably more difficult <laughs> than, than just that. Um, apart from anything, once you get past the twin or two gun turret, you have complications with how you manage the inner gun or in case of quad turret guns 
because with a twin setup, as you can see in, in this photo, this is, I believe, Duke of York under construction, because of the way that, the, that turrets are shaped, you're always going to have a little bit more room on the outer edges of any given turret, um, for the most part. And that gives you a certain amount of wiggle room to play with when it comes to loading the guns and maintaining them and all sorts of other things. Whereas, um, once you have three or four guns in there, then the space between uh, the space either side of those in internal guns is dictated by the external guns, either ones on the outer sides. And that's going to be considerably less, as you can see again from this picture, than you have with the outer guns, which makes loading those set either the center gun or the central guns considerably more difficult unless you start to provide even more space between the guns, in which case the turret grows considerably larger still, becomes heavier, more difficult to manufacture, takes up more space, takes up more weight, etc., etc. Plus, of course, the fact that however you build a quad turret, the machinery that you're using to manoeuvre that turret is going to have to be considerably more powerful than that installed on a twin. Um, if you're going with a common cradle approach, then you need to have exceptionally powerful machinery to elevate all four guns together, as opposed to three or two. If you're going for um, a four-gun turret, i.e. independently elevating guns, you have to now have four sets of machinery, which means four sets of heat buildup, four sets of power need to be provided. Um, so the, the potential for something to go wrong it gets exponentially greater and the potential for something to just cause a previously unexpected problem also gets exponentially greater. You know, for example, if you're using your four gun option, then four sets of elevating machinery in the same space might cause a heat buildup that's completely unacceptable, but two sets of elevating machinery in a slightly smaller space might not cause such a heat buildup. Now, of course, one of the biggest differences between the British and French turrets is, as I said, the, very loosely you can describe the French quad as a pair of twins in especially close formation, in part because they have this big central armoured bulkhead that runs down the middle that divides them off into two sections. That's why you have, when you look at the outside of the French quad turrets, you can actually physically see the two pairs, port and starboard, with a considerably larger gap in the middle. And this has a number of advantages, but one of the advantages as designed is that if the turret takes a hit, it might only knock out one half of the turret. The other half might be okay. So, I mean, if the turret is hit badly enough to distort the um, the shaft or, you know, make it jump its bearings or warp the barbette or whatever, uh, basically jam the turret as a whole, you're still stuffed. But if it's a um, spalling only hit or perhaps penetrating hit that doesn't cause any of the aforementioned issues, then that bulkhead might save half the turret, which then means you've only lost a quarter instead of half your armament. So, you know, that's a, that's an advantage. Obviously, a disadvantage is it takes up more space, which then means you have to make the turret bigger, as we said before. Uh, but it all, but then an advantage is that, in theory, you can just take well-proven machinery, etc., for twin turrets and go, OK, well, we'll have two sets, one over there and one over there, because that otherwise they have to be they are otherwise functionally separated unless and until you get all the way down to the magazines which will make weight issues slightly greater because it means there are certain things that in a completely unified quad or four gun turret like on king george v you can share that you can't on the french version but then that also gives you more redundancy greater reliability etc so it really is a little bit of a swings and roundabouts game as to whether you go with the kind of, as I crudely mentioned, crudely described, two twins in close formation or a single unified four-gun design. Either of them has advantages and disadvantages. And personally, I think if you're going for an eight-gun armament, so your entire main battery is concentrated in just two turrets, I think I'd personally go for the French option. The British decision on designing their turrets is made considerably more understandable when you realize the King George V was supposed to have three of them, at which point, you know, if you lost a turret, you lost a third of your armament, but that wasn't any different to if you had a ship with three triples 
and one of them was lost. It was just a slightly numerically higher number of guns. But then, of course, it got downrated. So as you can see, you have a twin and a quad forward and just one and then a quad aft. So the King George V are kind of right on the edge of where I would consider it acceptable to put that many eggs in one basket. Whereas you know, when you drop down to eight guns, I think the French hat were definitely onto the right idea. Nathapon Hongsherion, I think, asks, what problem or problems with the all-forward design led to the Royal Navy and Marine Nationale abandoning it in favour of more conventional designs in when they designed the Alsace and King George V? It wasn't so much problems as it was a series of compromises that, as things changed, became either less necessary or less acceptable. So one of the biggest issues with the all-forward design was that it limited the number of guns you could have. So you, as you can see here, this is Jean Bar with eight guns forward using quads, or you could have nine guns forward using triples, uh, like the Nelsons. But then if you wanted to have nine instead of eight guns, then you limited yourself in how many you could bring to bear at any one point, more specifically the forward arc. Um, whilst, of course, in either case, you're sacrificing the rear arc guns, which has it's not so much of an issue, but it is an issue potentially in some niche circumstances. Anyway, um, your main limit is, as I say, you're limiting yourself to eight or nine guns, because if you try and put more guns in, which would basically mean three quads, then actually you start to significantly run out of space on a ship unless you make that ship exceptionally large. The other problem is, as you see with the Nelsons, once you go past two turrets, if you want that all clear fire arc, you have to have a super super firing arrangement, you know, kind of like a Dido or an Atlanta style forward. And when you're talking about battleships, that's a huge weight and stability compromise. Whereas with the more conventional designs, um, so you, let's use like a South Dakota, North Carolina or, or Iowa as an example comparative to the Nelsons, you both got three triple sixteens, but by having one of them aft, then you've effectively not got quite exactly the same forward fire rock, but near enough for the same kind of design compromise and stability, um, but... Obviously, the, if with the Nelsons, if you do want that forward firing arc, then you're going to have this really, really tall sea turret, which is going to cause some, some big issues. So, as I say, limitation on forward armament, and there's no way you're going to get, you're really going to get around that. Whereas if you get with something like the Montanas, you can go up to 12 guns by just having a pair of super firing turrets aft. Another issue was that as battleship speeds increased, because, as I've mentioned in a previous dry dock, you have to have, with an all-four design, you have to have the um, turrets further back than you would conventionally have them in order to, to balance the ship out. Then you run into issues of there's no longer enough space aft to fit the engines and the machinery to get the ship up to a high speed. Now, obviously, with the Nelsons, they only needed to go up to 23 knots. Apologies, there's a plane coming overhead. Um... And so it wasn't too much of an issue, but even with the advanced machinery that was possible in the 1930s, the French really only get away with Richelieu and Jean Bart getting up to the speeds that they do manage on a machinery space layout that's somewhat sane, using some very, very special boilers and very high temperature uh, units. Now, if they had more conventional boilers... Um, even US Navy standard high pressure ones, they wouldn't have fitted because the hull has to start narrowing down towards the stern. So they would have had to drop speed. So that's that's another issue. Um, another, and then yet another compromise, and this was one that didn't really exist so much in the 20s. And even when um, the Richelieu's were being designed, wasn't really that appreciated all that much, was how necessary anti-aircraft defences were. So even if you look at Richelieu, which is the, the latest of the quad designs that go, or the all forward designs that goes into service, it's got on paper for its time a reasonably respectable anti-aircraft battery, 
but it hasn't got all that much in the forward arc because the forward arc is entirely occupied with the main guns. And similarly, you look at back at Nelson, even Nelson and Rodney in their later stages of life, they still don't have a particularly brilliant forward arc of anti-aircraft fire. They've got a lot aft, and you know one of the advantages of an all-forward design is you can have a really powerful aft anti-aircraft battery, but it does also mean a sensible pilot will try and come around the front where he'll face slightly less opposition than he will from a uh, more conventional laid-out vessel, which can have more of its secondary battery more forward on the hull and therefore able to fire um, and cover the forward arcs a little bit better. So, I mean, yeah, it, it's an issue. Now, some of, or potentially all of those issues could be obviated by one very simple measure, which is make the ship bigger. And this is which, where we come down to another aspect of the all-forward layout. The all-forward layout saves weight and therefore displacement of a vessel by allowing you to concentrate the armour belt. This, in turn, means the ship can be smaller, and that is good for the Nelsons, because it means they can fit in under 35,000 tonnes. It's good for the Richelieu's, because, again, they can try and fit in under 35,000 tonnes with, in both cases, more capability than the, the theoretical conventional matchups uh, of the same time period. But... That's because they're constrained by treaty. Now, yes, the Royal Navy was already looking into the all-forward design before that with the Washington, before Washington, with um, the various battleships and battle cruisers M1, M, N, uh, N, sorry, M2, M3, N2, N3, and you know, I's, J's, K's, G's, etc. for the battle cruisers. However, um, Although they weren't limited by treaty, it was still limited by trying to save weight and therefore save size on the ships to get them into certain dockyards. If you're not faced with those restrictions, then there is less pressing need for making those weight savings because you can, if you want a given amount of armament and a given amount of armour and a given amount of secondary battery and a given amount of ship, you can just build the ship bigger sure it'll cost a bit more but it you know that that may or may not present fewer compromises than going with the all forward layout and once the treaty system expired then yeah why not go with the all forward with, with a, a more conventional layout now of course in theory even if you were designing a 45,000 ton or 50,000 or 70,000 ton battleship if your limitation w was just a X amount of weight or X amount of cost, which to a certain extent is dictated by weight, then yes, you could get a more powerful vessel out of that displacement by using the all forward layout and concentrating your citadel because you'd either be able to make it slightly faster for slightly le because you're using slightly less weight or you'd be able to make it same speed but better protected because your citadel is shorter and therefore can be thicker for the same mass, etc. etc. So, yeah, you. An all-forward armament layout, even in an unrestricted building competition, will still give you a more powerful gun-dueling vessel than the conventional layouts will. But the margins, especially by the late 1930s, are slightly less due to advances in armor technology and machinery. And then you have all the other things I mentioned before, like the limitation on the number of guns so you, uh, th that you can have. So you're unlikely to be able to match a 12-gun Montana in gun barrel numbers with an all-forward design, um, or, with, or not with that, certainly not without a lot of difficulty. Um, arcs of anti-aircraft, gun gunnery, etc., etc., all of this kind of stuff. It's the, the little compromises that you have to make for an all-forward layout, and, you know, is it worth it at that point? And although people, including the Royal Navy, were still looking at all-forward designs, once you exited the treaty system and you weren't building up to the maximum potential size of your port infrastructure, all those little compromises tended to add up to a point where it was decided that a conventional layout might be a bit better. Galloper42 asks, prior to a gun engagement, how did gun tampions get removed? As they'd be in place to protect the rifling, and in harbour there are pictures of crew shimming out of the barrels, but I imagine that would be impossible 
for a battleship that was shipping water over the four peak in any sea state? Did they just pop them off with a breach gas clearance system and sacrifice them? So there are two main kinds of Tampion, and then one of them has a sub-variant. So the more famous and easily imaginable types, like you can see here, this is obviously on a US battleship. Um, the very basic Tampion has either a rubber seal uh, that keeps it in, or possibly some kind of screw wedge that keeps it in. But this is what they look like, they're, they're just cap covers. And the sub-variant is where you can then, spring load using spring-loaded clips, add a crest or something else bearing the ship's arms, coat of arms or whatever, onto the front of them, which is the most highly decorated version that you see. And sometimes that will also include this sort of casing that goes completely over the gun. Now, they are actually surprisingly easy to remove, relatively speaking. Um, you can, you know, one man can go up to the front of the gun if it's got a cover on it, unclip the cover, take that away, and then unclip, twist, and remove the tampion itself. Uh, obviously having a couple of mates with you makes the job easier, but it can be done. Um, also, in theory, you, to be honest, you probably get away with just shooting through the things if absolutely necessary. Um, but, usually, you'd prefer not to have to do any of those things, um, partly because it's a little bit of a gamble shooting through them, and also because... Um, well, even if you do shoot through them, it's probably going to affect the accuracy of your first salvo and possibly a couple of follow-ups. And if you do send someone out to remove them, as you said, in a high sea state or whatever, you may not really want to be sending sailors out there to do that. And the guns might have other things to do, like, you know, pointing up in the air and so forth or moving around. Um, but that's why you basically will never see this kind of champion in use during wartime. Um, you might see it in wartime when the ships are in harbour or something like that, but if they're actually out at sea patrolling with the possibility that they're going to come into combat and therefore have to use their guns, these type will have been removed and they'll have been replaced by a very lightweight version that's basically just a canvas, treated canvas hood that slots over it. It's enough to keep out the elements, but, as I said, it's, it's just a lightweight canvas. One, they're even quicker to strip off. If someone does have to go out there, you can literally just pull them off in 10, 15 seconds for an entire turret. And two, they are designed to be shot through without having any effect on the guns. So, absolute worst comes to worst. If you have the little canvas hood covers on, just fire the guns, and then you won't have them on anymore. Um... Also, as you mentioned, there is a compressed air system which is used to help clear out the gun, the smoke and fumes from a gun once it's been fired before you open the breach so you don't kill everybody in the turret with you know, hot gases. And just, you know, if you don't have the time to send someone out there to, to fish them off, then you can just activate that and that'll blow them off um, before you fire a shell. And that brings us to the end of this week's Dry Dock. Thank you very, very much for listening. It's now in just entering August, obviously, so hopefully, um, I'm hoping next weekend will be the live stream to catch up on the Patreon question, uh, alternate history questions from July, because, of course, the one we had a week ago was the one from June, much delayed by circumstances. And then we will be hopefully mercifully back on schedule again um, so thanks for sticking with that and well believe it or not nothing at this point is going horribly wrong in my life um plenty of things to look forward to um plenty of videos coming up um nelson part three or at least part three part one um of two due in october so for those of you who've been asking me for the past couple of years what's happening with that well now you know and a few other interesting bits and pieces coming up as well anyway see you around <laughs>